everyone and welcome to the She Clicks webinar about taking your flower photography to the next level. I'm Angela Nicholson and I'm the founder of She Clicks. So tonight I'm delighted to be joined by Rosie Lalonde who is in Florida right now and she is a very experienced flower photographer and she's a very experienced teacher and trainer and she's been doing a lot of online training as you can imagine over the last 12 months. So hi Rosie, how are you? I'm good, Angela. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's lovely to see you and it's great that you're joining us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. So you've been uh, a photographer for quite a long time and you really discovered flower photography, I understand, when you moved to Florida. I did and I moved to Florida to retire. So I really wasn't sure if I was going to photograph again or what that even might be. And I had a feeling that I wanted to get back to my first love, which was landscape photography. And then I went to local camera club and saw a presentation on flower photography. And it just moved me. And all I could think of is I need to, I need to know how to do this. And I thought with my experience of many years as a photographer, that it would be easy. And it is anything but easy. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's rather difficult, as a matter of fact. And so with all the different lenses and all the different settings and all the different types of flower photography that is out there, uh, I had a challenge for about a year uh, to get something that I was really happy with. And, and of course, I brought my many years of post-processing with me. And all I could think of when I looked at these flowers is my lens is too sharp. This is like photographing a bride on her wedding day with all kinds of, you know, problems with her skin. And the way I would treat th that skin is the way I started to treat my flowers. And about uh, five years ago, I began to develop a painting technique, which I now teach. And so almost exclusively, uh, my flowers are processed and then finished with painting. Um, and you guys will have a chance to look at some of that finished uh, product tonight. But this is more about if you don't paint, if you're just a regular photographer and you just want nice images, these are, uh, I'm going to give some good ideas of what can be done. Okay, that sounds great. Thanks very much. So um, over to you then. Okay, well, I'm going to begin by sharing my screen. There's Adobe Camera Raw. Okay. I shot this image very early in the morning and there was very little light. And this is absolutely not the color that this flower was. Um, and I was shooting with a, a Lens Baby Velvet 56. So in the way I look at what is extraordinary is something that you've taken from straight out of your camera, and you're now able to make it have that wow factor. The first thing that we need to do when we're looking for that wow factor image is to begin by making sure that we're using Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom to process the image for color temperature, local uh, global exposure, local exposure, and then for uh, any imperfections or cropping. So what I'm going to show you right now is this raw image is as shot the way we see it. However, we can go through all the white balance um, presets that Adobe has given us to see what we have. Now, my color temperature should be a little bit more around the 3800 mark. So let's see what else uh, Adobe has to offer in the way of presets. And these are all getting increasingly hotter and hotter and hotter, and that's not what I want. But I'm going to continue, and there's a method to my madness here. Now that tungsten is way too cool. And then there's fluorescent and flash. I'm going to go back to the fluorescent. And this fluorescent has nothing to do with the light that was available when I shot this image. It has to do with the fact that it has the right temperature and almost the right tint. 
So at this point, I am going to up my tint to about plus 32 because this was a lovely pink dahlia with some yellow. So at this point, I can now begin my local exposure. Now, I don't start with exposure, and I'll show you why. Exposure can't give you the right combination of light and contrast. So I always begin with highlights, and I lower my highlights. Well, why would I do this? This image is already dark to begin with. Yes, it is. However, I can see that there are some areas in this image that are threatening to be overexposed already, and I haven't even done anything. So by lowering my highlights, and I usually start with lowering uh, between minus 50 and minus 60. So I'm going to go at about 55 here. And then I'm going to up my shadows. Now upping the shadows can open up the midtones in an image and where there is no definition, you begin to see definition. So let's go back and look at this. This is before and this is after. The next slider that I use is my whites. Now this is not exposure, so please don't misunderstand. While it will push something that is already exposed to overexposure, whites is light contrast. We have light contrast and we have dark contrast and whites are light contrast. And globally, this looks good, but I'm going to add some exposure now. And for global exposure, that's looking wonderful. Now I want to talk about local exposure. Before I go on, I am going to move my highlights down just a little bit more and maybe move my exposure down just a wee bit. Okay. I use the adjustment brush in Adobe Camera Raw. You can use the adjustment brush in Lightroom to get your local exposure. So I'm going to touch my K key on my keyboard, which is the shortcut in for Adobe Camera Raw to pull up the adjustment brush. And my I have camera raw set so that all my sliders go back to zero each and every time that I have a new instance of the, the adjustment brush. And I'm going to begin by making some strokes or some marks and then apply my same recipe, lowering highlights, upping the shadows. Now, the shadows aren't giving me a whole lot upping my whites, and that's not giving me a whole lot. And finally, to exposure, which is putting exactly the amount of light I want in the center of my flower. I am going to touch the plus sign and get another level of exposure that I can work with. And I'm going to begin to touch some of these outside flowers with my adjustment brush to just add a bit more exposure. And right here in the middle again, and I'm liking that very much. So I'm going to open this in Photoshop. Now, the first thing that I'm going to do in Photoshop is I'm going to look at my levels adjustment. I just need to move my little panel here for one second. So going to adjustments and the levels adjustment, if you look at this histogram with me, you're going to see that there is an area right here that does not have any white exposure or light exposure. So bringing this back out, I'm going to move my white slider up to the point where we begin to see a blip in this histogram. This is before and this is after. And now we have this wonderful brightness that we did not have before. I'm going to open my next demo image and 
combining my two layers, I'm going to pull this into my demo file and I'm going to drop it. This is before, that's where we started straight out of camera. And this is after just a few adjustments in Adobe Camera Raw, and you'll get those same adjustments in Lightroom. And for me, we've already attained that level of extraordinary. This is soft and beautiful and has the right amount of light, and it speaks to the viewer. Now, we do have a few small distractions, and I want to tell you that the more involved you get with post-processing your flower images, the more you're going to see these little distractions. And removing those little distractions will take your image to another level of excellence and another level of extraordinary. So I'm going to uh, target my small distraction removal layer, which is just a blank layer, and holding down the Alt or the Option key, I'm going to sample this area of color right here. Now, I have just an Adobe brush. That's it. So if we go to the flyout and we look at our brushes, I just have the brush tool. And with the uh, color that I've chosen as my foreground color at this point, I'm going to use a 10% opacity brush and I am going to begin to paint over these little distractions. And as I move to different areas of this image, I'm going to continue to sample color so that I can get rid of these distractions. And we have some more of that in the bottom. So I'm going to sample a color down here and get rid of these distractions as well. And this is a nicely out of focus image at the edges. So uh, that little bit of small distraction removal did a great job of taking us to the next level. Now, if I felt like I needed an additional adjustment layer, I would do that here, but we don't. I can tell by looking at this image that we have pretty much hit the mark with both global and local exposure. So at this point, I would save this image and prepare it to post online. Now, when you post online, you want to remember that you are going to lose exposure. You will lose light and you will lose mid-tone definition if you're not careful. So sometimes, just for the sake of, I know I'm going to post this online, um, so, and, and I want to prepare for the worst, I will do another levels adjustment layer. And most often, since my global lighting of my whites is perfect, I will up my midtones just slightly so that I have a little bit of latitude when this image gets posted online, it's going to look great. Finally, I do want to show you that I have painted this flower, and this is my painted version. There is also a faux watercolor technique that I use from time to time, and I will show you what that looks like right here. If we have time at the end of the webinar, I would love to come back to this uh, faux watercolor and show you exactly how it is applied and how you would get that. But when we look at this, this is where we started. This is our first level of extraordinary and our painted level of extraordinary. And then we can go to our faux watercolor. So before and after, before and after, before and after. Are there any questions that I can answer about this image? Let me just have a look for you. We have one. Um... Jen has asked, how did you go from the brush to the sampling eyedropper? Okay, 
if you hold, let you know what, let's just do this together. Typing B for my brush and then holding down the Alt or the Option key, you would sample and then your sample is going to become the foreground color here in Photoshop. So if I sample um, one of these pink colors, it will come up there and it isn't coming up. So let's just take a peek, see what's going on. It would be nice if I didn't have my levels adjustment layer targeted. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> that's, that's not, that doesn't help. Um, I was painting on this blank layer. So when you're painting on the, the blank layer, certainly you can sample all around your image and find the color that you're looking for and then paint on your blank layer. You don't want to paint on uh, your image that you've corrected. Okay, any other questions right now? Can take one more. Yes, so uh, Geraldine's saying, how did you paint this flower? How did I paint this flower? I have developed a set of brushes and in Photoshop, I use those brushes to paint. It is probably a five to six month learning curve to learn it from start to finish. And that's part of what I teach through um, my website and my group. Okay. And um, we have another question, if that's okay. Yes, absolutely. Is, um, is there any difference between a mask and a transparent layer? Sure. So this is a transparent layer at 100%. If I were to make some marks in here with my brush and some my foreground color, there's my transparent layer with some color. However, if I'm on a mask, if I'm using a mask, let's put a mask right here. I can use now a black brush on the white mask and I can poke a hole through my image. So when there's an image behind it, you're going to see through this layer and the hole that I've made the mask to the image below. I hope that's answered your question and that I've understood you correctly. Well, it made sense to me, Rosie. Okay, good. <laughs> and we have a question about the Lens Baby 56 for photographing yes. flowers. Uh, so yes. asking, which aperture do, you, aperture, sorry, do you typically use? Typically four. This happened to be shot um, at 5.6, um, but normally if, I'm, if I want a Lens Baby image and I want it very soft, it's between four and five, six. I did want to get a little bit of focus on the edges here. So you can see that I do have that. Um, I also have taken to uh, taking more than one image with my lens baby Velvet 56 and then doing a focus stacking in Photoshop so that I have varying degrees of focus in different places. And uh, we'll be looking at a little bit of that in at the end of the webinar. Great. Oh, okay. okay. I'm going to close this image and we can move on. The next image that I'm going to show you is a sweet little cosmos that I found on the side of the highway in North Carolina. So my husband and I were traveling from Florida to Connecticut. Now, we didn't have a lot of time and I had one lens very quickly available to me and that was my 70 to 200. So I saw this in the distance and I saw the backlighting and I thought, I've just got to have this shot. But clearly it is quite ordinary. In fact, it's probably less than ordinary, but we can fix that. So. The first thing that I'm going to do is look at my white balance. And frankly, I love it the way it is, and I'm not going to touch a thing. 
So the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to crop and I'm going to touch the letter C for crop. And whether you're on PC or Mac, that is the same shortcut. And then I'm going to right click and I am going to change my aspect ratio to eight by 10. Now I've lost the bottom of my image. So I want to make sure that I'm bringing that back. I am then going to crop from either side to reduce my headroom. And when I'm satisfied, double tap to set my crop. Now there is this little distraction here and this can be taken out in Photoshop or it can be taken out in Adobe Camera Raw or uh, Lightroom. I'm going to make the choice to remove it here. So I'm going to touch B and I am, I've got my healing brush and I'm going to heal rather than clone. The one thing that you need to know about this technique is you need to give a wide berth to your selection. Now, Photoshop had very rarely chooses the right place to select from. So you're going to need to move this. And you might wanna try a couple of different places to find an area where you enjoy that crop. Then touch the letter B again so that you can see what you've got. And I'm going to go back because I'm really not totally happy with that. And B for my brush. Here's my selection and I'm going to move this again. Yes, I'm much happier with that. Touch B for my brush and I would then go to my recipe, lowering my highlights, upping my shadows, upping my whites. I'm gonna up my shadows even more because you can see that starting to bring back some nice exposure in this midtone. And then I'm going to add a little bit of exposure. Now, I always pull my image out so that I can see the global exposure that I've created. And this is really quite perfect. Now for my local exposure. So I'm gonna get way up on this image, touch the letter K to get my adjustment brush and size my brush accordingly. Again, my sliders are all set to zero and I'm going to make a few marks and I'm going to look at my recipe one more time. Now, I don't need to be concerned with overexposure, so I'm not going to touch the highlights. I will up the shadows and that's doing a little, but not much. I'm gonna up my whites and that's doing a little, but not too much either. So we're gonna have to depend on exposure. And so I would try to get as much exposure in as many places as I possibly can. Here's the rough part. When we try to get down into this stem, you have to be ever so careful because it's very easy to get overspill of exposure on either side of a stem. So we can hit our plus sign and get another instance of this brush and start with exposure all over again. Let's come back out and get a better view of the entire image. And for now, that would be enough local exposure for me. But I am going to open another image in Photoshop. And this is where we are out of Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom. These are the changes that I made. So what I want to do is You know what? I don't have what I need here. So I'm going to go back to this image. Okay. 
I'm going to open this in Adobe Camera Raw. I'm sorry, in Photoshop. And I'm going to do a few other things here. One of the first things that I'm going to look at doing is looking at the exposure of this area right here and looking at my distractions. So let me deal with the exposure first. I'm going to go to a levels adjustment layer. And if I'm being honest, I do see a tiny little bit of area here that has no exposure. So I'm going to pull this up. And that's given me global exposure. If that is too much exposure, you can pull back on that if you would like. Now that's one way of satisfying a global and a local exposure. However, this green still is not light enough for me. So I'm going to hold down the Alt or the Option key and touch the plus sign in the bottom of the Layers panel, which will create a new layer. Now that I have this dialog box, I'm going to change my blend mode for this layer to soft light. I am going to fill this layer with a neutral gray, and it will be called a 50% gray layer. This is a dynamic way of both adding light and dark contrast to your image. It does also work with uh, bringing up your exposure and lowering exposure. But for the most part, because this is a 50% gray layer, it is going to be used for contrast mostly. I'm going to click OK, and you will be able to see this 50% gray layer. And if you were to sample this, you would find that this is exactly uh, 128 on a scale of 0 to 256. I'm going to touch B for my Photoshop brush. Make sure that white is my foreground color. And touching the number 1 on my keyboard, I will get a 10% opacity brush. I am going to make my brush smaller. And I'm going to begin to paint in some exposure on the base of this flower. Little smaller brush. Now we're at 10% opacity on this brush, but every time we paint over an area that we've already painted on, it's upping this exponentially. So it's 10%, 15%, 20%. And we never want to start with anything more than a 10% brush because we would be way out of the ballpark with exposure and contrast. Now, when I look at this, that's much more to my liking. And this was actually much easier to use than the adjustment brush in Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw. This has some of this beautiful little stamen peeking through these cracks. So I'm going to lighten this area as well. Before and after, before. And just think, <laughs> we already did some um, added exposure to this in Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw. So this is really helping tremendously. Again, this is a little known Photoshop golden oldie. I'm going to now add a blank layer and I'm going to deal with these distractions that are in the image. The first thing that I'm going to do is touch the letter J. And if I go to my flyout, I want my spot healing brush or my patch tool. I'm going to go with my spot healing brush 
And I'm going to size my brush uh, first of all, so that it's at 0% hardness, but then a little bit bigger than my distraction. Just like we did when we took out the distraction at the bottom of the image in Adobe Camera Raw, we need to give our distractions a little bit of a wide berth. And I do not have the right brush. There we go. Absolutely, this needs to be 0% hardness. Uh, even if it's at 1%, you will start to get a little bit of um, line showing around the edge where you uh, removed your distractions. And these are very tiny. So I'm going to make my brush even smaller and just tap, 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 so on and so forth. If you were going to paint this flower, you probably wouldn't need to do all of this, the small distraction removal, but certainly in areas like this, you would not want that there if you were going to paint. And I also see some dark area here. And I'm going to begin to test Photoshop's algorithms by trying to bring the yellow down and the tan up. Great. I think we've got that. So now for our little friend, the ant. Sorry, sweetie, but you got to go. So I'm going to take this in small little bites. And now this little tentacle. And while I'm in this area, I am going to select by coloring this area right here. And it's more than I need, but you will see that gives Photoshop the opportunity to give us a really nice removal here. I'm going to take the next piece and do it. And I know from experience that this was going to be a hard one, but that's okay. Because if we don't get everything we need, we have another trick up our sleeve. Oh, that worked very nice there. And I think we can just, yeah, look at this and be very happy with it. But if you needed to or wanted to, you could touch the letter S for your clone stamp tool. And on the same layer that we've worked on, you can come in and cover over any of the areas that you may be displeased with. So at this point, I would begin to do some larger distraction removal. And I have that set up here in my demonstration image. Now, to help me with what I'm going to do, I have created a cutout of the image that I just worked on. And here is the image with the background. I'm going to turn the visibility off to my flower and stem cutout layer. And I am going to above my flower and stem cutout layer add a blank layer. I want to take out some of this bokeh in the background. While these uh, flowers in the background are truly lovely, um, th th it really does interfere with this image and I don't want it there. So. I am going to hold down the command or the control key, and I am going to tap on the little flower image on this layer. And what that's going to do, it's going to load my cutout as a selection. 
Now, at this point, this selection is saying you cannot make any, uh, you cannot paint anywhere but inside the selection. And that's not what we want. We want to paint outside the selection. So targeting their blank layer, I am going to click on select and inverse my selection. You can also use the shortcut key, shift command I on Mac, shift control I on PC. And now I can't paint inside of my flower, but I certainly can paint outside my flower. Now, in the previous image that I worked on, I was able to paint out some of my distraction, and I'm going to do the same thing here. So holding down the Alt or the Option key, I'm going to sample, and I'm going to begin to paint on my blank layer, and I can get close up to my flower and it will not harm the flower. And I am at a 10% opacity brush. I'm going to touch the number two on my keyboard and I'm going to make this a 20% opacity brush. And I'm going to keep sampling colors so that I'm not picking up weird dark colors from one place and, and putting it everywhere. We want to stay as close to the colors that are in the vicinity of our distraction. So this looks like a seamless removal. Now getting into this area, I'm going to sample there. I was sampled right from here and painted, and I'm going to sample here and paint. And as you can see, my brush extends way across these petals, and it is not touching anything there at all. What I did do is I brought some paint on the underneath of my petal. So that's something that you have to be very careful of. We can just go back and sample this and put it back. I'm also going to tone down this dark portion of the bokeh right here. And I'm just tapping with my brush. I'm going to add some light into this very dark shadow area under this petal and pull out to see what I've got. before and after, before and after. So I'm quite happy with that. And I will show you how I went on to further make this image extraordinary. The first thing I did was I, excuse me, I made my own background layer from my cutout. So all I did was use the cutout of my image and the image below, and I was able to make this background. I then painted my flower and it's ready for my signature and posting on Facebook. Again, I would target my top layer, touch adjustments, go to my levels adjustment layer. And this is really looking quite nice. And again, I might up my mid-tone slider by a bit, but that would be it. So that takes us from our SOOC image. Let's do this, SOOC image, to the image that we perfected in Photoshop and took out all of our distractions took out our large distractions, and then painted. So are there any questions on this image?
Yes, we've got quite a few questions. So um, one question we have is, do you always leave your profile on Adobe Color? I do, uh, unless I know that I'm going to print an image for a specific paper. Then I, I create my image the way I want it, then apply, then save that image, apply the paper profile, and do any adjustments that I think are necessary. Um, but yes, I shoot in sRGB and use Adobe, Adobe um, 1998. I'm thinking that it is as my profile. OK. Um, so why do you shoot in sRGB, if you don't mind me asking? No, that's absolutely fine. Um, as you and I have talked, I have recently switched to um, the Nikon Z series of cameras. And I found that when I, I was shooting with that camera, uh, there was just some color and some saturation that was totally throwing my workflow off. Yes, I can get in the camera and I can change those things. But frankly, um, with running around Mach 49 with my hair on fire, I just don't have the time. So I started to use the sRGB profile in that camera, and it's put me back to where I was with my D850 shooting Adobe uh, 1998. Strange, okay. but true. <laughs> <laughs> and you're shooting raw as well, aren't you? Yes, I am shooting, always shooting raw. Yeah, because I thought they had no color profile, but there are sort of things affected these days with raw files. But OK, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, do you, somebody's asked, why do you use heel instead of clone when hiding the extra flower? It works. Um, let's go back and let's use heel and see what happens. Okay, I'm going to return this to the default. And I'm going to just do the crop that we did so that we can actually see this um, specifically the way it was. Ah. Come on, be nice. Thank you so much. Okay. Touch P for the brush, clone, and I'm going to do the exact same thing. It's definitely working here, but I have had multiple experiences with this not working as I'd hoped that it would. And um, the long and the short of it is yeah, see, it just, the long and the short of it is, I've always found that heel did a better job for me. Now, that's me. Uh, if you're happier with it the other way, there's no reason not to go ahead and, and use, uh, as, as, um, use the clone if you, if you so desire. Clearly, if I was doing this in Photoshop, I would not use the healing brush, I would use the patch tool. So again, different people, different preferences. Hopefully that has answered your question. There's always more than one way of doing things in camera. Roll there is. The shop, isn't there? But, there um, really is. I find that the heel is often a slightly more sympathetic repair, but occasionally it's not quite strong enough, if you know what I mean. And then if you yes. switch to the clone. You yes. Can get it sort of almost right. And then sometimes I run around the edges with a healing brush. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, Manti has asked, how do you get the selective brush to highlight? The selective brush to highlight. Oh, um, I, you know what? I don't, I really don't understand the question. Okay, okay. Well, uh, Mandy, if you want to have, uh, try typing that in a different way, then we'll, I'll, Come back to the question later. Um, I've got a question, a, a couple of questions, I think. About Excuse me. I think she might have been talking about the selection that I made oh, and it okay. loaded the 
it loaded the um, cutout as a selection. Right. So if, if that is the question, it's simply hold down the command or the control key and target the little picture on the cutout layer and it will load the selection. Uh, it will load the cutout as a selection. Okay. And if, if that's not the answer, just please help me understand that's all. Um, oh, Mandy's saying it was one of the first adjustments you did. It was to the green you were blending. Uh, so the 50% gray layer, maybe? Maybe. I'm not sure. Okay. Come back. So believe, before that. Before that. So that had to be in Adobe Camera Raw? I guess so. Okay. No problem. Let's take a peek see. All right. So let me just do a real quick global. Oh, she said yes, it was to do with the distractions. So oh, it was to, to do in Photoshop then the distraction in Photoshop. Um I thought she meant camera raw, but because it was one of the first adjustments you did. Okay, so it, then it might have been the selection of the distraction at the bottom before we moved on to Photoshop. All right, you know what? Let's just get that distraction so that it shows and we won't worry about the crop. B in Adobe Camera Raw to get the healing brush. And then here is my selection and I will sample a few different places to decide where I want to take uh, my healing from. Is that good? Okay, we... I think so. All right. No, no further comment, but yes, hopefully. Okay. So we have a couple more questions. Um, do you always use 56% flow? Always. That's a personal preference. That doesn't mean you need to do that. That's just my personal preference. That works well for me all of the time. And so, um, yes, it's there. And, and you know, I, it's amazing that somebody saw that and brought it up because I don't even think about that anymore. It works so well. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a similar question about opacity. You keep it to 50%. Could you explain your reasoning there? 50% opacity on... Uh, the only thing I think we did at 50% opacity was the, or may, maybe we're talking about the 50% gray layer. I don't know. Oh, I'm not sure. But uh, maybe you could just explain wh why you vary the opacity brush. Uh, sorry, the opacity. Oh, the opacity on the brush. Got it. Okay. Easy. All right. So, I don't know what the PC shortcut is, but on Mac, if you hold down control and option, that will allow you to size your brush and it also um, changes the hardness. But over and above that, when you're working with a anything that is adding color or exposure, I touch the number one on my keyboard and it's 10% uh, opacity. If I find that the color that I'm adding is not dark enough, so let's just add some green right here. If this were not dark enough at 10%, I would touch the number two and go to 20%. If I'm doing um, a levels adjustment layer and I want to bring a, a target the mask and I'm using my black brush, I will use a 30 or 40% opacity brush, but never more than that. And this is particularly helpful if you're using a mouse. Um, if your Wacom keyboard is set up appropriately, you could probably touch very lightly and vary the opacity of the brush. However, you can't do that with a mouse. So it's important that the opacity match what you're trying to accomplish um, in your finished image. 
you want your technique to look polished. You want it to be almost invisible to the eye, except for those that may may have a lot of experience and can look and say, oh, you know, look, they should have used a less opacity there. So you want to um, make your transition seamless. You want to make your painting seamless. And so that's why I vary my opacity. Okay, thank you. And um, on a similar vein, someone was asked about you, they didn't understand how you got the 50% opacity for the gray layer. And I'm surprised somebody hasn't asked before now. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm so glad that you're recording this and they will be able to go back and see this. This is very easy. So holding down the Alt or the Option key, go down to, let's see if we can get this to enlarge. Yes, this little plus sign at the bottom of your uh, layers palette. So holding down Alt on PC, Option on Mac, click on that little plus sign. Here is our new layer dialog box. We're going to go from normal mode to soft light. You could also use overlay, but that gets a bit harsh. If you felt like you needed more um, contrast than what you're getting, then definitely change it to the overlay mode. So once we have soft light, we can now fill, uh, check this box that says fill with soft light neutral gray, 50% gray layer, click OK, and then touching B for brush and the number one for 10% uh, opacity. And you can begin to add dark or you can begin to add light. So white for adding light, black for adding dark or contrast. Okay? Okay, great, thank you. And um, a couple of people just saying that they didn't really follow how you got the cutout layer. <laughs> that's because that's a lot of education <laughs> and a lot of practice, right. but I do my cutouts in a variety of different ways. Part of what I educate in is how to get this kind of seamless cutout. It takes practice, but it's absolutely doable. And um, that's probably as far as I can go with that right now. Fair enough. And just, I think one last one on this one, someone was saying, could you just explain again how you sample the colors, please? Oh, sure. We want to absolutely always make sure that we have a blank layer to start with. And I'm going to uh, just zoom out of my image a little bit. Touch B for my brush, hold down the Option key on Mac, Alt on PC. And you can move this little turkey baster or eyedropper anywhere you like to sample a color. And let's say we're going to use um, this green right here. And then we would be able to paint with that color green until we sample again in another place. Okay. Yes, and you see the, the boxes in the toolbar, the color boxes, they change color when you that's on correct it, so kind of a dark and gray, hopefully gray. you can you can see that yep yeah. so if I sampled here um and again I think um we're we're on the right layer so I'm not sure why uh we're not getting that but I just sampled some of that pink pinkish lilac color and it does change And um, just one last question before we move on from this image. Someone is saying, uh, what is the purpose of the 50% layer? You, you did mention it, but perhaps we could just. Sure. Um, good. Thank you. 50% gray layer. Um, you know what? Let me just put a clean one up here so we can see. Is 
you know, not multiply, soft light. <laughs> okay. So if I want to lighten this area right here, when I use a white brush to paint on the 50% gray layer, I am getting this wonderful exposure. If I take the little portion next to it and I say, you know what? I wanna paint, I wanna darken this and I paint with black. That's a good way to darken. That's also a great way to add contrast. So before and after, before and after. We have light on the left, dark on the right. Okay, that's great. Thank you. It's part of the, the magic of Photoshop, really, isn't it? When you're using it, it really, it really, really is. Okay. Um, moving on then. Yes, please. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. All right. We are going to look at the very first official um, flower photograph that I ever took. I was with a friend at Longwood Gardens in Pennsylvania, and they had just put these poppies out that morning. And there were people on top of people, on top of people, on top of people, and you just couldn't get near them. And so, my one and only chance to shoot this was take out my 70 to 300 lens at five, six and take this shot. And is it pretty? Surely is not, but it gave me an opportunity to learn and it, it's giving us the opportunity to, uh, for me to show you what to do with images that, you know, you might have to shoot in a rush and are less than perfect. So the first thing that I do want to show you is I used Camera Raw for Photoshop to uh, take care of the exposure on this image. And, you know, for the sake of time, I'm going to show you my settings. And to go back and forth between a layer in Photoshop and camera raw, you do have to make your image a smart object. And that is as simple as right-clicking and choosing uh, convert to smart object. I've already done that. So I can go back to my camera raw, raw filter that resides inside of Photoshop and show you that I did follow my recipe for lowering highlights, upping shadows, upping whites, and upping my exposure. That's the global exposure. If I touch the letter K, you can see that I have three different instances or three different layers of local exposure correction. And I used the same, I used, excuse me, I used the same settings for this area and this area. However, when I got to this area, this was slightly yellow. So what I did was is I lowered my temperature so that I did not have yellow, but instead um, lowered the yellow and pushed into the blue for temperature. Okay, bear with me one quick second. Okay. I did make a cutout of um, my corrected, my exposure corrected image. And when I looked at it, I felt as though I needed a levels adjustment layer. So I did add that. And again, for the sake of time, I won't demonstrate all of that because we've looked at it twice. 
So I'm going to go on to repairing this pistol and stamen. I have my cutout available to me. Now, I went back to Longwood Gardens the very next year so that I could shoot these poppies again. And I found a poppy that had a nice pistol and stamen. And so what I would like to do is I would like to cover this pistol and stamen with this that I captured a year later. And generally, that's a pretty easy fix. But in our case, let me just rotate in the right direction here and enlarge my image. In this case, the other pistol is much more demure, uh, much thinner. And so my job is to cover this area right here because otherwise it's going to show. Now, you might think that I'm going a little far in doing what I'm doing, but after a lot of practice, I'd rather be safe than sorry. So I'm touching the letter L and I'm choosing my polygonal lasso tool. That is the lasso tool that I use most often. So that's kind of my default. And I am going to make a selection. And with my cutout targeted, I am going to select, modify, and uh, feather. You can see that the shortcut for this is Shift and F6. And I want a 12 pixel feather. The reason I'm asking for a 12 pixel feather is because I know that's what works after trying six, eight, and 10. I want this as smooth and invisible as possible. This is a 6,000 by 4,000 image just about. So this works well for softening those edges and using Command or Control J, I am going to put that selection on its own layer. Targeting this layer, I am going to engage my um, transform tool by clicking on Command and T on a Mac, Control T on a PC. And I'm going to pull this down and I'm going to cover up the little mess that's here. Then holding down the shift key, I'm going to pull up the center, hold down the command or the control key and pull these lines into place as best I can. Double tap to accept that. And then using a layer mask, I'm going to get a black brush at 30% opacity. And I'm going to blend the petal in with what I've cut out. And I'm fairly happy with that. <clears throat> so I'm going to switch to this image with the pistol, hold down the shift key, click and drag this on top of this image that needs the repair and drop my image. Now it's not gonna drop where my cursor was, it's going to drop where it, uh, it finds center. And so something in the neighborhood of this is what I'm looking for. I'm going to touch my escape key and pull out on this image. And that is pretty much perfect for what I'm looking for. Okay, with that said and done, I now need to find a background for my flower. Now, I thought at first I would start with 
something that was a blue sky or had some blue in it. And, oh, wouldn't this be lovely? And it just did not appeal to me. Now, it might appeal to you. So if this were your image, you have to choose what you're happy with. I went for a darker background that I created with some texture in it uh, because it picks up light in different ways and uh, reflects that light differently. Now, seeing that my original image had this dark background and it made the poppies stand out uh, was the one and only reason that I went with this dark background. Now, I'm going to show you another way to add a little bit of light to any area in an image without using a 50% gray layer. Now, you can't use this in the way that I have in the previous uh, image, but for adding a little dab of light or dark, this works wonderfully. So I'm going to uh, put on the visibility to this layer and touching B for my brush, I'm going to enlarge my brush and making sure that I have a 0% hardness and a 10% opacity, making sure that white is my foreground color. I'm going to tap in this area here and tap in this area here. In some cases, you can leave that just as is. However, that really stands out like a sore thumb on this dark background. So I'm going to change my blend mode to soft light. You can choose um, screen, you can choose multiply, you can choose overlay. But for me, the soft light works very well. Now let's take a look at this before and after. It is ever so slight. And you know what? That's all I really wanted. But now that I have it, I can tap in a number of other areas to add just another little hint of light because I want to. All right, now I have to darken down these stems. And I'm going to target my stem colorization. It's just a blank layer set to normal and holding down the command or the control key, I am going to target my blue poppy cutout layer and tap on the picture, which is going to load my selection. Now I'm not going to inverse this selection because I want to darken down what's inside of my selection. Touching the B for brush, I'm going to sample a color in that area right there. And with a 20% opacity brush, I'm going to dampen down this color. Not a lot, but enough. Okay. Before and after, before and after. Now, you can take this image as is and you can post it. I want to cover the por a portion of this stem with my background. Now, normally that could be done using the clone stamp tool. However, because of the variation in texture in this background, that would be a daunting task. And, and I, for one, wouldn't want to do it. So what I'm going to do is target my background layer and using Command or Control-J, I'm going to duplicate that layer. And I'm going to pull it up over my stem. Now, this doesn't work because it's covered the entire image. So holding down the Alt or the Option key, I'm going to click on my layer mask icon at the bottom of my layers palette. And that gave me a reverse mask. Now, as most of you probably know, when you have a completely black mask, that is going to hide everything 
that is on the layer. And so it's hiding my background texture. That's okay. With the same brush that I had and making white my foreground color, I am going to use a 30% opacity brush and I am going to bring back my background layer over these stems so that they aren't quite as stark and it seems more like it's part of the image. And again, you can absolutely post this to social media. Um, you can have this printed this way, but I went a step further and I did paint my poppies. But I also want to show you how to add a Nick filter to this image that we had uh, that we had stopped with just previously. In order to use a Nick filter, a topaz filter, a um, D, um, not DXO, Luminar filter, you cannot add any filter on top of what we have here. You need a layer that is completely filled with pixels. And probably the easiest way right now to do that would be to select all of these layers. And if we right click, we can merge these layers. I generally use a shortcut key uh, that I have on a Photoshop action. Sometimes when I go to look for the real way to do it, it's like, where was that anyway? Okay, so now that we have this layer that is filled with pixels, I can click on Filter, Nick, and I'm going to go to Color Effects Pro 4. Now, there are a lot of Nick filters that can be used to uh, make something wonderful out of this image. But my favorite is Glamour Glow. Um, it just has that beautiful glow. And if you can see, my Photoshop is working on the fact that um, I have content aware crop um, engaged. So anything that would have been cropped out is not cropped out on my image. But let's look at this Glamour Glow filter. When I click on the little windows that are on the right side of the uh, layer, I can come in and I can test all of the different possibilities for presets that Nick has for me. And truthfully, any of these work. I like the stronger glow, but I want to warm this just a little bit. And I'm going to take the glow down a tad and I'm going to click OK. What I was trying to accomplish was this Glamour Glow filter right here. And if you look at our perfected image and the Glamour Glow on top, it probably is worth taking this opacity down just a tad, but I find that uh, this Glamour Glow really works with flowers so wonderfully. Um, and let me just go back and show you um, what I've done with a couple of Topaz filters. Now, I like Topaz for the fur and feathers. And I'm definitely not going to tempt fate by trying to do this <laughs> um, live. But that's what fur and feathers looks like when it comes out of topaz at 100%. So I do lower the opacity to between 25 and 35%, just so that I'm getting this beautiful texturing of the flowers. This is totally acceptable to post as is, but I did another uh, Topaz filter and that was Buzz Sim. And so again, this is Buzz Sim at 100%. And of course I did the Buzz Sim texture 
on top of my fur and feathers. So I'm going to lower the opacity of this to about 80%. And it's a nice combination of the buzz sim and the fur and feathers. But being a glutton for punishment, I'm going to add the Glamour Glow on top of this and lower this opacity to maybe 25%. So it's, it's taking away some of the warmth that is there, but it's just another way of combining all of your uh, plugins with each other and coming up with the very best possible image that you possibly can. So are there any questions on this image, uh, even what we had done before? And I'm gonna go back and open that up. So if we have questions on anything that we did here, I can address it. Okay. Um... Someone is asking about when you create a background, mm -hmm. um, what, si what size do you make the background or the canvas? Most often 6,000 by 4,000. But if I have a specific image that I know that I'm going to be using the backgrounds with, I take whatever dimensions the size of that image is and make my texture accordingly. Okay. so. Because your camera is a 24 million pixel uh, camera and it produces uh, 6,000 by 4,000 pixel images, you produce. That's what I devices. use most. Yeah. But if I use my Z7 and I have mm -hmm. a 50 something megapixel image, then I'm going to take those sizes and make my texture according to that. Now, truthfully, having that size sensor is great for one thing for me, and that is I can put a, uh, a long lens on it and switch to DX mode and get more of an extension on my 700 to 200. I'm then at 105 to 350. And so when you do that, obviously you're getting a 24 uh, megapixel image. So I don't do a lot of textures at that large size, but I have on occasion. Okay. Um, someone has asked, what's the difference between merging and flattening layers? The, <laughs> the difference between merging and flattening. I wanted to keep my original image on the bottom here. So if I flattened the layer, it would get rid of that. Not only that, it would have gotten rid of my painted layer. So what I did is I just took what I needed and combined them into uh, one layer. There is another technique, and that technique is this, holding down Shift, Option, Command on Mac, or Shift, con Shift Alt, Control on PC, and then touching the letter E, and that is going to put all of the pixels into one layer. And we still have our layers below, should we decide we want them, because we just feel like throwing this away. So that would be the difference. Okay, that's, uh, that's very clear. Um, interesting question. Someone is asking whether Nick filters are only for Nikon. Now, you might think that. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh, no, that, and I can as well, but no, uh, that you can use them with any image. In fact, if you took an image with your phone and decided you were going to process it in Photoshop, use Nick filters. Absolutely do it. Yeah. So Nick, uh, the full name is Nick Collection or Nick Collection by DxO. So they've been through several ownerships. Yes, but yes. Now with DxO, we we're doing a, a great job of make it, developing it and taking it further forward than uh, yes did. so that's yes good. okay um right another question about nick collection can you use your images in um comp still 
Compo yes. Uh, yes. Count as your own. Oh, competitions. Sorry. I'm competitions. Gonna... Sure. Sure, you can. Um, you know, I, I haven't seen um, a photo competition yet that um, doesn't or expects you to um, give them a raw image or an SOOC. You have to finish the image clearly. And this is a pet peeve of mine. When I shot film, the lab did my finishing and then I sent it to competition. Well, now I'm the lab, so I have to do that. Now, I don't think that your competition is going to be looking for, you know, way out crazy colors or, um, you know, abstract looking things, unless it's that kind of competition. But clearly, Nick is helps in finishing your image. Your, your competition may ask, what did you do to this image to finish it? And of course, if they did ask that, you might want to say. Now, in some of my uh, lessons, I go on to show how to take most of the Nick filters and make them yourself in Photoshop. That's a whole four or five hours in and of itself, but that can be done. So if it's a problem with we don't like the name Nick, there certainly are ways to manipulate in Photoshop so that you're getting the exact same results. Um, another question is, what's the best way to make a complementary background from your original image? Um, again, that's a 10 hour class that I do because I've developed brushes that do it. But that said, let's go to this image right here. If I were going to use this image and wanted to get my, my a background from this, the very easiest way to do that would be to make your cutout and then use whatever brushes you have to colorize the background. Um, blurring it is not going to help, and that really makes it look plasticky. So, um, you know, the best I can say is without doing the course, try whatever brushes you have to paint your background in, in any way you can. Obviously, you want to do that, uh, having your selection first, and then inversing that so that you can come in and begin to paint in these areas. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, someone has asked, did you do all this as a smart object or change to a normal image? Did I do the were filters? You working, were you working on everything as a smart object or did you change to a normal image? No, nope, change to a normal image. So we had a smart object right here. The minute that I flattened or um, got rid of this layer. This is not a smart object. So when I combined those and went on to step two to do my pistol repair, I no longer had a smart object. Okay, and uh, quick question was, uh, was Glamour Glow a Nick filter or a Topaz filter? It was a Nick filter. Uh, someone has asked if you could just quickly show again how you added the new stamen. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Okay. Let's take this off. Take this off. Let's take this off. Take this off. Um, hit, touching the letter R to rotate my image. I work better when I can see the angle that I'm working with. I used the polygonal lasso tool to make my selection. Using shift F6, I'm going to get a 12 pixel feather and I'm going to cut this out. Using Command or Control T, I'm going to pull this down below. I'm going to 
Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to leave those areas there. Sure. I'm going to, um, I need to open, I guess. Yeah, because this closed. I'm going to open my pistol and stamen, shift, click, drag, come over to this image, drop, and then commander control T to place that and put it where I want. Escape to come back up and that's it. Great, very quick. <laughs> It, get, it it won't be that quick the first time, but I promise you, you'll get there. <laughs> um, Pat has asked whether you ever use uh, radiance in Topaz instead of uh, Glamour Glow in Nick. I don't. I'm not a huge fan of Topaz. Nothing wrong with Topaz. They're wonderful, flip, wonderful filters. However, I don't like the workflow. So... When I do use any type of filter, it is generally Nick. Um, I still have a few uh, Topaz filters that work outside of the whole interface that you have to go through to do this or that. That just troubles me to no end. So, you know, I stay away from it for the most part. Again, because I paint my images, I'm not a huge user of any plugin of any kind. Fair enough. Um, um, a couple of people have asked, um, well, they said that they still don't really understand what you mean when you say that you paint your image. Okay, fair enough. So let me, okay. Um, this would be the flower image prior to my painting. When I painted it, it looks like this. So again, I have developed a set of brushes that work in Photoshop. And on a blank layer, I am able to use those brushes to paint. You do need a Wacom tablet, no doubt about it, because you need the pressure sensitivity. So, um, I guess if you would like a demonstration, you can come on over to my website and find the link for the webinar that I did on demonstrating exactly how it is I paint. Could you just sort of explain what it is you're painting in? Sure. So if I added a blank layer and I picked up one of my brushes, I'm painting on the blank layer and I'm painting on top of the flower. But without the brushes, without the Wacom tablet, this does not work as advertised. Mm -hmm. um, but that it's as simple as that. Yeah. So you're basically kind of painting in some form of effect. Yes, exactly. And you know, for people that don't want to spend a lot of time with their, their images, this might not be for them. There are ways of painting images quicker and doing it more of a um, Georgia O'Keeffe type of style. I also teach that. But most of the members of the group have said, this just relaxes me after a long day. Let me just sit down with my painting and please just let's paint something because it's therapy to my soul. And frankly, this was born out of that for me, um, you know, in finding my place in my retirement and going through a lot of things personally, I began to look at my images, my images and say, I know there's something more. I know there's something more. And as I began to develop this, you couldn't tear me away from it. I have to be torn away from it now because we're developing a second volume of painting. So I don't have a lot of time to even sit down and paint what I like, but um, 
this is, um, it's therapy. It, and so it's not a quick fix. And you, you would be really hard pressed to paint the same image twice the same way. When people post in a group uh, their lesson, no two flowers ever look the same. I've tried to replicate image that I painted for one reason or another. I can't do it. So it has so much to do with your psyche, with your mood. Are you listening to music? Um, you, you know, uh, all kinds of things. So it does take time. And I think that's it. So I do have one more image, uh, it, but if you have more questions, please, I'm, I'm open. Well, um, we have one question that's popped up quite a, a few times, which is about cutouts. Now, you, you, I know you've said that it's a very mm -hmm. complex thing and it's a very, um, you know, it's something you have to practice a lot. But um, someone has specifically asked whether, you know, about areas which aren't sharp and whether you would feather the selection. I just wonder whether you might be able to sort of give a few. Sure. Comments. I think you can see here that you have some of both because there were varying degrees of focus here. Um, I, I want to be fair to the people that have paid for this information. So I can say that there are a variety of ways to sharpen edges. However, if you are going to paint, you can see these are sharp edges. These are not. And so as part of the painting process, those edges can get sharpened as well, if you want it. If you don't want it, it, it doesn't have to be, but um, the technique for cutting out is probably four or five steps. Uh, and I'm going to be upgrading that very shortly uh, because as Photoshop changes, so do your so does your ability to get better and better cutouts um but this is definitely just knowing the right way to go about it and practicing and if you want to sharpen your edges clearly you can do that with a selection okay thank you okay did you say you have one more image yes we have the image that is going to do um stacking of images in Photoshop, even if you're not working with a tripod. This is the completed image and it is lightly painted. However, it started as this image and this image. These two cosmos were taken in the same place as our number two image, pink cosmos. Um, so the wind was blowing. I was teeter-tottering with my 70 to 200 lens. And as much as I can do this pretty good in camera, this was a bad job. But I'm sharing this with you so that you can see that even with two kind of definitely not well-balanced and one on top of another images, this can still be done quite well. The first thing that I'm going to do is um, tell you that these have all been corrected in Adobe Camera Raw for local and uh, global and local adjustments, and they both match pretty well. To start this process, you go to File, Script, Load Files into Stacks. And we're going to say, Photoshop, please add the files that I currently have open. Clearly you can browse for them, but I find this easier and I click OK. Now Photoshop has made me an untitled image with both of the images and they're still uh, askew from each other. But, and I'm going to change this so that A is on top of B. I'm selecting both images. And if you don't know how to do that, it's click on the first layer, hold down the shift key, click on the second layer. And I'm going to go to edit, 
auto align layers. And just make sure that auto is on and click OK. They are now aligned because if I shut one off, I can see that the other one is right underneath. And yes, we have a circumstance where we've got some edges that aren't there anymore that should be. But the next step is going to take care of that. So with both of those layers selected, I'm going to go back to edit and auto blend. This algorithm is meant to reveal sharpness in an image, those things that are in focus, let's put it that way. And I want to make sure that I have checked seamless tones and colors, and that I have checked content aware fill, transparent areas. And these are the transparent areas. Click OK and wait for Photoshop to crunch the numbers. Commander Control D to take away the marching ants. And there is our image on its own. That's worked remarkably well. It, really. Um, if you have time and those that are with you would like to know how to um, get this so that it fills all the areas of the image, I'm happy to demonstrate that or we can stop here and take questions. Sure, let's, let's go for it. Okay, so with my untitled image, I'm going to throw away both of these steps and I'm going to crop and I'm going to go for an eight by 10 crop and I am going to, well, let's please play nice. That's really not the crop I wanted, but it's the right um, ratio. And I'm going to move this a little bit that way. Double tap and we're done. Now, I'm going to do a couple of cutouts. With my polygonal lasso tool, I'm going to cut out, make a cutout here of that petal. And using Command or Control J, I'm going to put it on its own layer. I didn't bother to feather that. I didn't bother to do anything. It's not necessary. I'm going to go back to target uh, my layer with the combined images. And I'm going to make a selection with the polygonal lasso tool right here. Again, Commander Control J to put, its on, to put it on its own layer. Let's start with this cutout. Commander Control T to get the transform tool. And I'm going to begin to stretch this. Once it is stretched sufficiently, I am going to hold down the control key and I'm going to play with the angles here. So now I'm skewing this into place as best I can. Now I'm going to have an area here that isn't covered covered, but that's okay. I'm going to add a layer mask and um, I need a normal brush. And I'm going to use 20% opacity and black paint. And I'm going to take away this hard edge right here. I'm going to target the other layer. Commander Control T, and I'm going to stretch this cutout as well. 
and put it into place again, holding down the control key and using the corners to skew. Double tap to accept, add a layer mask and I will paint this away. If you've gone too far, you can paint back in what you need. Okay. And adding a blank layer, I'm going to go back to our regular brush, holding down the Alt or the Option key. I'm going to sample in an area where I want to cover the rest of this background. And I'm at 20% opacity. I'm going to go with 30. If you want to make the ridges, just sample that color, make your brush smaller, and you can make a faux ridge right there. Okay. Next, I'm going to come down here and paint in these little distractions. And start sampling color here and paint in. And that is it. And so um, that is the finished image, unless of course you want to paint. And we've gone from ordinary to extraordinary in every image. It, are there any other questions? Um, we, somebody has said that they've got, they haven't got a Wacom tablet, is she doomed, she says. Only if you want to paint. Um, and I would say if you are, if you have your heart set on painting, look around for a used Wacom. People buy them and they don't know why they buy them. And so they sell them. And I, quite a few people in, in our group have gotten them on eBay. I don't know if you guys have eBay there or not, or if th there's some other marketplace that you would have where people would sell used equipment. Yes, yes, we have quite a few, so. Okay. Yes. Okay, yes, and actually, um, they're not that expensive these days. I mean, obviously, if you get no. for one that's got the screen on it, that's quite expensive, but the-, the It is. Ones are quite affordable these days. But you, I would, be remiss if I didn't say that the Wacom Pro works best for painting. So I want you to be aware that maybe getting the small tablet and people love the little small ones. They're not too much more expensive than just the entry level one. I had someone recently that had an entry level one and they were not able to make strokes as needed because the pressure sensitivity isn't there it, it, to the degree that the Pro tablet is. Um, right. Okay, well, uh, Rosie, um, there's lots of people saying thank you very much. They've really, really enjoyed um, hearing from you and seeing your magic appear before their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. That is, that is so good to hear. Truly good to hear. I appreciate that. <laughs> and there's other people saying that they can't wait to get out and take some more flower photos so they can try some of these processes. Absolutely. And um, if you're if you post them in she clicks if they wouldn't mind referencing that it was something that they saw in the webinar i think maybe other people will go and watch the webinar and i would just love to see what they used and how they did it and i'm excited to to see that i have to say it's probably the <laughs> favorite thing of mine about the webinars is i always enjoy the webinars themselves but afterwards for the next couple mm -hmm. of weeks we see lots of pictures that have been inspired by um the webinars and it is really really wonderful to see it so um, yes i look forward to it and it's a great time of year at the moment isn't it, it is and it's been really great hearing from you thank you very much 
Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.